welcome. I'm Angie Butler. It's the 2nd of August 2020 and today I'll be in conversation with artist and illustrator Corinne Welch. So Corinne, you work a lot with hand-drawn and printed elements. Can you just take us through the images, processes and techniques that are used here that we can see on the screen? Yeah, sure. The, um, so on this, on this screen, there's kind of a mixture of different ways that I work. Um, in the top left is digital illustration, um, but I'm really interested when I use digital uh, methods, I kind of quite like to mimic, um, hand, well, I use handmade textures and I build things up like I would when I'm doing printmaking. So I kind of work in a very modular way and break things down into shapes. Um, so you can see the, the parrot illustration in the, in the bottom left there, that's all done with rubber stamps, but it's all kind of each, each element of that bird is, is kind of cut from, a, from another little bit of rubber and I kind of build up the textures and the layers just in the same way that I would with a digital illustration. So there's kind of a crossover between the two. Um, I'm very interested in, in making patterns um, and I use rubber stamps a lot for that um, and using collage um, and, the, and the book making is kind of the central part of my, my practice really outside of my professional work as a designer and illustrator. So I could just talk through, I've got a few slides coming up just uh, to talk through some of those different, different approaches. That would be great. So the rubber stamps, um, I started doing this, I'd done quite a bit of relief printmaking before I did the MA, I started the MA at UWE. Um, and then in 2012, I did a workshop with Stephen Fowler on rubber stamps. And I kind of, I just fell in love with it as a process. I just really liked, I think it's the slightly more instant gratification than you get with woodcuts or, or lino. Um, and that you can work quite, I like working small, so that, that, that suited me as well. So I kind of felt you, you could get quite instant results. You can cut things quickly, um, stamp them up, and then if you, if you don't like it, it's kind of not the end of the world. You haven't invested two days of your life kind of carving something really intricate out of a piece of lino or wood. Um, and I quite like the modular element of it that you can kind of use, particularly with patterns that I can, you know, I've built up a library now well, I say a library, a, a large chocolate tin full of um, different patterned uh, rubber stamps that I've carved. And then I can kind of mix and match and come back to things that maybe I haven't used for a couple of years. And then they might be used in combination with something new. Um, and they, it works in a completely different way. So I quite like that element of chance that you get with, with rubber stamps. And it's why I've never got on with screen printing. It's kind of like everything is about that one print and then you wash the screen away. And I, I quite like the sort of hoarding nature of, of rubber stamps so I can build up um, a sort of different, different things to use. So I just, I'll move on to the next one. So collage is something I've been doing really since I was at school. This is like a real constant, I think, in my practice. Um, even, you know, going back to GCSE and A-level, I was doing stuff with collage and I, I think this appeals to my sort of slightly control freaky part of my brain in that actually there's an element of chance in there. I guess similar to the rubber stamps in that you don't know what you're going to get, depends on the pressure that you use. And with collage, that element of chance is increased even more because it's, it depends on what materials you've got to work with and um, just how you, know, how, how you cut things out. And, and the, I use a scalpel and, and scissors a lot in my work, but I, I kind of like that. Um, that element of wonkiness that you get with hand cut shapes um, which again contrasts with with my kind of quite precise way of working when I'm when I'm drawing which is sort of a, a lot neater um, so it's a mixture of those those sort of two things coming together but um, but again I just I don't I don't use it particularly in my professional work very much. It's more it's often sketchbook based work, but it's it's kind of um, a good way of kind of coming up with original initial ideas for things that might start as a collage and then develop into something else. Mm -hmm. um, just going to the next one. This is all about drawing. Um, drawing's really at the at the root of everything that I do. I mean, it's kind of why I'm a designer illustrator to start with. It's something that I've loved since I was. A very small child it's just 
um, I, I think it's just my way of, of working things out when I, you know, it's a different way of thinking and, um, and I find it, I find it quite meditative as well. So I've always got multiple sketchbooks on the go and um, drawing various things, you know, whether it's stuff in the garden or uh, quite often my dog, particularly now he's getting a bit older and sleeping a bit more. I've got quite a lot of those going on. Um, but, uh, but yeah, again, often the sketchbook stuff, um, it sometimes ideas take quite a while to percolate so it could be an idea that I had two or three years ago in my sketchbook it might take that long to actually come to fruition and actually become a little book but um, it's quite I find it quite useful if I have a bit of a block just going back through sketchbooks and going oh yeah there was that idea that I was thinking of two or three years ago I could do something with that so, um, so in the top right here these were actually done from uh, drawings that I did on a trip to New Zealand back in 2004 and I'd, I've just constantly had something in my, at the back of my mind that I want to do something with these little drawings of Pukekos um, and it's only this year that I've, st I've started to work on that and thought oh yeah that could that could work really nicely as a little book um, so that one that one's particularly long gestation period usually they're not quite that long but um, but yeah it's, it's a useful way of, of just kind of recording ideas as you have them and coming back to them um, I'm trying to move on to the next one. This one's about stitch, which I sort of have a long-standing fascination with, with embroidery and textiles. I do a lot of crocheting and it's something that I started to investigate on the MA and then kind of got waylaid with making books. But um, I'm, I'm quite interested in that crossover between work on paper and uh, working with textiles and so in the in the top left there I, I do a bit of embroidery which is a work from drawings that I've done and then translate that into a, a stitched line um, and on the, on the MA I did a bit of um, investigation into using digital embroidery to do this and and that was quite interesting I, it there were nice results but I I realized actually it's the process that I'm interested in so as soon as I wasn't involved in doing the stitching I kind of didn't feel the same level of pleasure or ownership over the, the final piece um, so that kind of taught me quite a useful lesson that actually it's it's about the making that's really what I enjoy is the the process of, of doing um, and handing that over to a machine to do even though that's a lot quicker and a lot neater it, it sort of took the fun out of it and it wasn't really a route that I wanted to pursue um, there's, I mean, there's a good natural crossover with books, with the stitching, so the Coptic band stitching in the bottom right there. Um, and then also stitching onto material, which I can then make into book cloth. Um, and the two projects on the right, the top one was a, a project, a call for books for reimagining medieval books for the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Um, and how I worked with that was to, to draw, draw plants then I, um, on the computer, then I got those printed onto fabric digitally and then I stitched over the top of them. So in a way I was kind of obliterating the, the digital, it was really almost like a colouring in exercise. Um, so then when I came to do the bottom book, which was a, a book uh, in response to an exhibition about Fr uh, Frankenstein, the 200th anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein, I drew straight onto the fabric with um, pencil crayons and then I and I stitched on top of that but I left a bit more of the sort of um, the colour underneath so that was a sort of a, a development of that idea and that was making a one-off book for the exhibition but then I brought that back digitally digitally so um, I photographed the embroideries and then made a digital version digitally printed version just a small edition of 20 books because um, I felt I'd put so much work into creating this one-off book for this one exhibition that I kind of wanted to, to sort of have another life really and just extend it a little bit. So that sort of interplay but again between doing stuff by hand and then reproducing things digitally, um, I kind of like to sort of flip between those two really. Um, it's sort of an, an ever unresolved tension but it's something that, that is quite a constant through my work. Uh, Move on to the next one. This is all about pattern, which again is quite a constant through my work. Um, so often I think I've talked about using uh, rubber stamps in my sketchbook quite a lot just to come up with new ideas for different techniques or colour combinations. And again, I, it works really well in sketchbooks because it's so immediate. Um, 
and the middle picture is um, for some of the prints that I made on a typewriter to make a little book of, of typewriter patterns and that was inspired by going to see the Annie Albers exhibition at the Tate in 2018 which I found really inspiring um, and she used she did an exercise with students at the Bauhaus I think back in the 1930s where they she asked them to make uh, patterns with typewriters as a kind of basis for weaving patterns and that kind of piqued my interest again it's just that, that interplay between using um, stuff on paper and stuff on textiles and I kind of I've, I've got this idea that I'd quite like to print some of these patterns then onto fabric and stitch back into them so it's um, yeah balancing that working on paper and working with textiles. Um, in the bottom left there are, these are my um, a set of um, funky foam tiles that I've made for workshops with children and I've, I've found that working with pattern with with children or adults in workshops is a really good leveler because people often get children or adults thinking oh no I can't I can't draw so I can't do this or I, I haven't made a book before so I can't do this but once people start stamping patterns every it's, it's everyone is at the same level really um, and you can create something really quite beautiful quite quickly um, so I found those a really useful sort of ice breaking exercise in workshops um, although the local cub group did give them quite a hammering last <laughs> last autumn so they need a bit of um, they need a bit of repair at the moment um i think that's probably all there is to say on that one uh, okay thank yeah. you it's um it's really good i think as we're not meeting physically in person to to give people an overview of of the processes and the techniques that you're using and you can see the the diff, sort of differentiate between them uh, as it's really useful then as we go and, and have a look further into your work we can kind of we, it helps identify um, and people can relate to to um, your work better I think and you mentioned about kind of moving from print sort of flat two-dimensional prints to books saying during the last year of your studies the the MA at UWE you concentrated on making artist books I'm wondering can you say what prompted your interest in using the book form for your work maybe to talk about the transition from prints to books yeah the it's a weird one really because I, st I started the MA in 2011 and I had um I had no no interest really in the front of my mind about making books at all. It was very much I started it as uh, to learn more about printmaking. Um, and then I did a, uh, an evening course with you in spring of 2012. And I just had a bit of a light bulb moment where I just thought you can, I think it was when we were making hardback covers, but with embossed, with, with book cloth, but with embossed shapes on the front. And I just thought you can actually create an object and suddenly... I started stopped seeing a book just as sort of um, a folded piece of printed material and, and and I just kind of saw a lot more potential of the idea that the it could tell much more of a story than I felt that I, I could tell in just a, a flat piece of work mm -hmm. um, and this this book here which, which is my best-selling book I'm still I'm still sort of printing and making these um, eight, <laughs> seven eight years on and, and it's just it seems to be no matter where I sell books this is the, the constant one that always sell, sells best and it and prompts a really positive reaction from people and and it started life as a, a risograph print of well it started life in my sketchbook of trees that I drew on a train because uh, I go over to Oxford for meetings, or I used to in the olden days, go over to Oxford for meetings um, on the train. And I often would be drawing in my sketchbook on the train. So I had lots of these little drawings of trees that I'd drawn from the train that I made into a print, which I kind of was, I was sort of okay with it, but it didn't, there was something about it that I didn't quite feel. It, it kind of reflected the, the original um, work that I'd done. Um, and then I cut after, I think it might have been after doing your workshop, I, and we did something on concertina books, I chopped this print up. Because um, a lot of my printed work was in either grid structures or kind of um, collections of things. And so it kind of lent itself quite naturally to, uh, to this sort of concertina format. So I chopped this print up, really very roughly cut it together, and suddenly 
I thought that's more interesting. And actually when I'd drawn the trees, it had been on a journey, a train journey. And so suddenly that this, this narrative structure came in behind, instead of it just being a collection of trees, I thought, well, I can just call the book what it is. It's 20 trees as seen from a train. And then the end papers have the, the, the place and the time of where I started the journey and ended the journey. So Bristol Parkway at 9.31 and then Didcot Parkway at 10.16. And it's a simple idea, but it's really interesting to see people react to it. People have, do, you know, if people have done that journey themselves, they react to it in quite a personal way and think, oh yeah, I do that journey a lot. That's really nice. I can, you know, they can re re react to it in that way. Or people might be more interested in trees or people might be more interested in the resograph process and they're buying it because they, they like it as a, an example of that. Um, it's but really it just nice. seems to chime with people. Yeah, it's really nice the way that the, the prints become really active through, through the book structure and also for, for the way that you, you've handled uh, the, the drawn element of them. They're also, they also seem quite um, playful as well. There's a kind of, there's a sense of humour there, I think, it, you get coming through because um, they're so characterful too. Yeah, I think the resograph process really helps that. And I think, again, that comes back to that element of chance thing, that there's a slight misregistration that you often get with resograph. And um, so instead of it being very neat, as I might do it on the computer, it kind of looks, it gives it a bit more energy as things dance around a little bit because it's there's a slight mismatch between that teal colour and the black. Um, and also the black not being a completely solid flat black, I think that really helps as well, just to give it a bit more texture. Yeah, they really come to life, you know, they're, they're, they, it gives them that sort of almost kinetic feel to them. With, with them talking about, you saying about the concertina format, which I think is, is really good for um, the 20 Trees book, and you use that a lot in your work. Can you um, say why that is? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, some of it is a, is a sort of, uh, I hesitate to say it, but it's a mildly commercial decision in that pe people, I think, sometimes when people see, if people aren't collectors of artist books, they're just coming across them for the first time, they might think, oh, I really like that little pamphlet book, but what would I do with it when I got it home? I might just put it in a drawer or stick it on a shelf. Um, and because they're very visual books, people want to display them and the concertina format it kind of sits nicely on a shelf or a mantelpiece and because I work small as well it's not like something not like you're making a big in investment to kind of something that's going to take up half your sideboard it's just kind of a little it's almost like an extension of a greetings card but it's got a little bit it might be telling a little story or, or, or a collection of things and so I think it, it appeals to uh, people who might not otherwise um, buy artist books or be interested in artist books so I think it's kind of um, it's kind of widened the appeal of them um, I also like the fact that you can just use it really tiny so I've done quite a few different matchbox books like this one here um, called Incognito using um, scans of stamps from my dad's old stamp collection and, and again the books that I don't think about too much are always the ones that are my favourite that I just kind of I have this idea and then I just execute it and make it and, and don't sort of labour over thinking because I can do that sometimes just over ponder and sort of think about all the different elements and so that's um, and it's also quite it's also flexible in that you can use it with circles like I have done in the bottom right there and I think there's an example coming up of a, a double concertina which kind of inter, interlocks two concertina books together and it takes on quite a different form. Mm, it, it's really interesting I think that you've also thought about after the book is no longer with you what might happen to it how it's going to be shown uh, how someone might do, enjoy it in their own domestic environment as well yeah and it's interesting that people it's interesting to see people interacting with them because everyone expects when you open a book because they uh, they mostly do look like traditional books and so people when people people have an expectation when they open it that it will behave like a normal book which will be stapled or bound in some way along the spine and and people people sort of react in a really positive way when they think oh look at this it kind of opens opens right out um, and children particularly seem to find it rather fascinating 
uh, yeah, the way it kind of, yeah, concertinas. It's just, I think, I think it's just a, it's a more active format, I think, for people to interact with. Uh, yeah. But you can also read it in your hand like a normal book. Yeah, it kind of really alludes to more the, the visual rather than reading as such with kind of more textual work, doesn't it? Definitely. And you mentioned um, with the 20 trees that it, it's, kind of, it's your bestseller um, and um, with these about the kind of viewer's experience. So um, it's obvious that you do sell your work. I'm wondering what outlets you've found that suit you in, and your practice really because you've talked about how you've seen people interacting them with with your books which is interesting too yeah that and that's that's one thing that i've really sort of an unexpected pleasure of making books and probably something that keep keeps me making them because i'd probably still be making stuff in a in a vacuum otherwise i'm not particularly commercially minded because i've got a i have a a job being a self-employed graphic designer in illustrator so I don't I don't need to make books to earn a living not but well, I'm not sure if you could but um the the I think that that's not my impetus really but it's 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 really nice to see people um how they how they respond to the books and how they open up open them up and and also often they start conversations so a lot of them are so the the 10 white birds book there there's actually not not an awful lot to it but people can project their own stories onto it and so um, often books will start conversations with people about things that you know it reminds them of or why it resonates with them and I find that I find those conversations really interesting and in a way that I wouldn't really get previously with my print artwork I think there's something a bit more intimate about someone holding a book and then chatting to you about it rather than standing back and viewing viewing work in a frame Mm. Um, this is my table at Babe at the at the um, Arnolfini last year, so you can kind of see how the concertina books. It's not just about how it works in someone's home; it's actually really good for for displaying at these sort of events as well, because they they open out and it puts on a nice sort of colourful display. Um, and I try and have the smaller books on the table at the front so people can pick them up. And I always encourage people to handle the books. I'm not precious about that because actually that, that's what they're there for is to pick up and to look at. And, and generally people are very respectful and careful, you know. Um, so I haven't, I've, I've never got a problem with people, people touching the books. I actively encourage it. I can just see from the image that you put up, it looks like you've got a sign saying that they're handmade books, so people can actually see that um, from the sign almost before they engage with the book. Do you think that that makes a difference? So if people recognise that something is handmade, that they almost, they're seeing it as, as having a value? Yes, I, I think so. I had an interesting conversation at a local art trail that I did. Um, and that, that's sort of interesting because that's not, um, that's not an artist book fair where people are coming just to see artist books. There's, you know, it's, it's paintings, it's drawings, it's pottery, it's all sorts of things. And so there's a, there was a guy that was chatting to me and he said, he said, I really like your work, but I do, I do think it's a little bit expensive. And I, and I was a bit surprised because I, I generally try and keep my prices quite low because they up my ethos is that I like the work to be accessible to people um, and so I talked to him about the process of, of making the book that he was looking at and he was really shocked and he kind of came around full circle and ended up by saying you're not trying you're not charging enough for this. <laughs> because he just thought I think he just thought I'd sent I'd maybe just sent them off to a, a factory in China or something and then they just came back to me and I was selling them so he was sort of looking at them almost like a, something that he would buy commercially in a shop um, and it not it not occurred to him really as the the level of of work that would be involved to sort of create something like that. Mm, so he was he, yeah he's under the impression that they're mass produced. Yeah, which which I guess I should take as a a compliment really. <laughs> he couldn't see that it was <laughs> it was all bodged together with bits of PVA and greyboard, but um, but I thought it was it was an interesting conversation that made me think it's actually important to kind of chat to people about about the process and but when people realize what's involved i think they do value the product products more because of the the work that's gone into them and i think some people can't actually believe that i could be bothered to make these things in, in small editions <laughs> <coughs> 
<laughs> but I sell my work through my online shop and also at Makers Gallery um, sort of and in Colston Row in, in Bristol. And so I've just started selling with them last year and that they seem to be selling really well there. And, and so that just seems a really nice fit for my work because they have lots of different artists work in that um, gallery's shop. And um, so I'm hopefully, hopefully um, they're going to ride out this current storm and um, that can continue. Great. I I kind of want to, when you sort of started to talk about making and the thinking behind and explaining the process to someone, there, there is a sense of reducing the subjects of your images to what appears to be their most simple form, but without losing the integrity of what they are. And I imagine this to be quite a complex and challenging process to reduce something, um, <clears throat> to, to simplify it for want of a better word, but to actually keep the treeness of a tree or, or the, uh, the essence of a person, etc. And I wondered whether you could talk us through some examples and, and the, de uh, sort of the developments that you've made with this way of working. Yeah, of course. The, this one, Forest, is, um, so again, this is another one that started off life in a sketchbook as sort of silhouettes of dead trees that I'd drawn. Then I cut them out into stencils and then I started playing around with rubber stamps. And so instead of cutting the rubber stamps, I was using the cut paper stencils to create the, the images by sort of blocking areas out and building up layers. Um, and I, I was interested in in the sort of textural nature of this in the in my sketchbook um, and then at the same time I wanted to I'd, I'd read in a book about this double concertina book uh, which was just two concertinas with with slots that, that slotted together but it, it takes on a much more sculptural form and so almost doesn't feel like a book anymore it feels like you're opening out something um, yeah a bit more it's just got a lot a lot more form to it a lot sturdier um, and I and I was interested in the idea of having a book that was that had elements that you could see inside, so this kind of glimpsed elements. And because of the abstract nature of this work, I felt that, that this would translate well to this format. So I made an original book that was all hand stamped, and realised very quickly that it took so long. There's no way that that, that was just going to be a, it, it, that would just be a one off. I couldn't be making an edition of those. Um, but there, but then I scanned in those original um, stencil stamps and created um, artwork for a double concertina book. But the first one I made, the paper was a bit shiny and it was, I made it a lot much bigger than the original and it, it just, it really lost some of the integrity of the, that the original had. So then I made a second edition where I shrank them back down again and printed them on heavier paper and it was like a more textured watercolory type paper. And I was really surprised, it was a really interesting exercise to see the difference between the paper, you, you need to make the right, the right paper choice and the right um, format choice to, for a book to, to work properly. Um, so that's, that's kind of a lesson that I've learned um, in some other books. If something's not quite right, there's probably a reason for that. And it's, it's about kind of finding wh which, is the, which is the bit that isn't working. Yeah, I, this is a really interesting work for me, I think, with the, the structure where you have to peer in, as you say, and, and you look round it. It's very much, for me, it evokes that feeling of being in a forest where you, you know, you're surrounded, you're not quite sure where to go. And, and it kind of, it, it activates the way of looking that you would have if you're in that environment. So I really like it. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. It's yeah, I think I like it because you don't necessarily just look at it flat on. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes a concertina book isn't that different from looking at a print on a wall, but this one has a bit more energy to it. And like you say, it can be viewed from different angles um, or displayed in different ways. Um, this one is kind of the opposite end of the scale where um, I was saying that the books that I like the most generally are the ones where I don't overthink. This one I possibly did overthink, but the, the content is much more personal than, than most of my books. Um, this was in response to a call for um, work for an exhibition in Greece back in 2018. Uh, the book's called Home, 
and I based it on the 10 houses that I've lived in in my life, which was uh, useful, but that was an even number, so it worked with the Constantina book. <laughs> um, uh, and I did a, and again, I, I wanted to, I was interested in a, uh, looking at a pocket Constantina format. Um, so I had the idea of making, I'll just go on to the next one. So the drawings of the houses were done on carbon paper, because I like that as, um, I like to sort of think of the ap appropriateness of, uh, of the right sort of medium. And I like the transitory nature of the idea of carbon paper, that it would fade over time, although the, although the, the edition was actually digitally printed, but just the fact that it was drawn with carbon paper, I sort of, I it felt appropriate to me. Um, so they were they were digitally printed, and then I had um, hand stamped the the numbers of the houses on top, uh, and then I hand wrote the names of the streets. And I'll just flip back to the other one. And what happened that I had typewritten memories, so three memories from each house. I I, I wrote on a typewriter underneath the uh, the. Um, house and I'd also date stamped the years that I lived there but the, the idea I had was it's a little bit like library tickets checking in and checking out so you lift you lift the house out of the pocket and the memories about that house are kind of hidden inside that pocket so the kind of it works without you taking it out of the pocket but I just like the the sort of slightly hidden interactive nature of that that if you chose to pick the book up and interact with it there was this sort of extra element and the cover was covered in wood, it was a hardback cover covered in wood chip paper because I felt that was a constant element of all my childhood <laughs> homes in the 70s and 80s and student houses in the 90s. And then I thought, and I spent my adult life moving into houses and stripping the entire house <laughs> of this stuff that I can't get rid of. Um, so it felt like this wood chip paper has been a constant, rightly or wrongly, through all the houses that I lived in. So I just... It's sort of little elements like that that I, I find really interesting to to sort of layer up in work um, but this one was probably a bit more overthought than than some of my work but I really enjoyed working on it um, and I put a quote on the end, end papers by Frank Cottrell Boyce he it was something I just wrote down and he said in a radio interview that I just really liked he said when when we call a place home we lift it out of geography and I kind of wrote that down and thought oh, I really like that I would like to be able to use that one day in something yeah. And I just thought I really like the sense of that, that actually it's it doesn't necessarily and this book isn't really personal. It doesn't it, it might start conversations with people about houses they've lived in. But obviously no one's going to look at this book and go, oh, yeah, I remember that house that you lived in when you were 14. It's not it doesn't it doesn't sort of resonate in that way. Um, but I like the idea that there are all these anonymous buildings dotted around the country um, all are important to me and all have this connection to each other. Yes, and I like the the domestic archaeology with the with the wood chip wallpaper as well. And I'm wondering, you know, in 50 years time, whether if people are looking at your book, whether they would have that same connection or whether it's something that's going to go into history itself. I hope it does go into history. It's, <laughs> I've got a whacking great roll of it and I don't know what to do with it because I'm certainly not putting it on the wall. <laughs> um, okay. Do you have this? Oh, sorry, go on. I was just going to say one more thing just to say about this is that it, it, this book actually started a couple of workshops that I did at primary schools, which were really fun because the book did start conversations in, with children about places that they'd lived and places um, that were important to them. So I, I'd run a, I ran a couple of workshops where we made giant concertina books where we did polyprints. Uh, all the children did polyprints of their homes or their, where they'd like to live. Um, but I kind of asked, I made the mistake of asking a question at the start of the workshop as to how many houses everybody had lived in. And we kind of counted up and people kept their kids, kept their hands up for how many houses they lived in. And there was one lad who's, I think he was nine years old and he'd lived in 12 houses already. Wow. Uh, just amazing. Um, but yeah, I just kind of like the idea of books as a starting point, either for conversations or workshops or, um, yeah, so they're not just... Um, a piece of work in isolation they sort of uh, they have a bit more life to them this was um, set as a challenge my friend Eva in Sweden sent me some um, letra set um, it's called letra film but it's made by by Pantone back in the 70s and 80s she had a stash of it so she sent sent some to me and said I'm sure you can do something with this 
So I set myself a challenge. Um, so an hour, I spent an hour after work each day for 10 days and each day I made a tiny collage from this lecture film. Uh, and they all ended up having little white houses in them. That was what linked them. So I didn't, I wasn't doing it to make a book, but um, at the end of it, I thought I could, I could um, reproduce this into a small book. Um, and this was another one that I, in the, in my initial attempt, I made quite a bit bigger than the original and it just lost, lost its integrity. So then I shrank it back down again and printed it on nicer paper. And then that's been much more successful. Um, but you can see in the middle picture at the bottom there, I, I have the artwork. When I scan it, I set it all up with, with crop marks on the computer and then send it off to be printed. Um, so they come back in flat sheets. So there's quite a bit of sort of mathematical working out of how, I, how many books I can get out of one sheet. And this was three books out of one SRA3 sheet. Um, and then the, the, covers, the covers were hardback covers, but I have the, the, the paper covering um, digitally printed. So again, it's that combination of some of it is digitally printed, some of it is um, handmade to actually make the actual book structure itself. Now, I know that collaboration is important to you, and I wondered whether you could take us through a couple of projects. Yeah, certainly. Uh, this is, so this is a project that I've done with, with Eva Hedström in Sweden. So Eva and I met um, on a UE summer school back in 2013, and um, our work is, we're both interested in making books, but her work's very collage based and mine is, is more fears towards the rubber stamping, but there's a quite a crossover between what we're interested in visually. Uh, and we just get on really well as friends. And so we'd, in 2017, we decided to start a collaboration of exchanging words. So a, a word in English and then a word in Swedish, um, and that we both separately illustrated these words. So we've, we've completed that now and have a whole alphabet of both have 26 illustrations as almost as a conversation between the two of us. Um, and we're in the process of making those up into a book. Um, and so that's been, that's been a really, really fun part of our friendship. And we've kind of got to know each other through working on that, that book together. And I, and I sort of feel that we, our styles influence each other. And um, yeah, we just, it's just a very, very um, interesting, interesting to have a, a friendship with someone at a distance like that but that that's through shared interests that's been that's been really a really strong inspiration on me in the last few years mm, that's great that um you met at uh, ue summer school as well and you've been able to sustain your relationship and and develop work together can you just explain what the the um image on the on the left hand side is is that from a publication uh, yeah that's that's from Uppercase magazine. So they asked, I think it was for their 10th anniversary, they asked people to write in if they had any stories about how they had Uppercase magazine. And um, when Eva and I first met, she bought a copy of Uppercase magazine from the Arnold Feeney and she brought it into the workshop and I'd not seen it before. This is quite early days. And so she lent her copy to me and I looked at it. And as a result, we both ended up subscribing to this magazine um, and we lost touch for a year or so and then we both put some work in as an open call uh, to the magazine I think in 2015 um, and, and both our work was featured in the same edition and as a result I got back in touch with her to say oh isn't that weird that we both had work in the same, same <laughs> thing since that point we've stayed in touch and our friendship has developed and so we just wrote a little piece about that and how the A to Z project had kind of come out of, of this friendship that started off by, by sort of a shared interest in Uppercase magazine. So it's just quite a nice crossover. Brilliant. Um, and this is a, a project for the Artist Book Club at UWE, um, which was run last year um, through the summer holidays and then in, up, up to Christmas. And it was called the Exquisite Sketchbook Project. Um, and so everybody started with a very plain, uh, you can see in the top left there, just sort of a, a plain craft paper covered uh, sketchbook, basic sketchbook. And then they were sent on, each sketchbook was sent on to five separate people in turn um, to alter in some way. 
Um, and I, f I found this a really interesting project to be involved in because you had to respond to other people's work. You couldn't necessarily, apart from the very first one that you did, you couldn't fall back on your usual way of doing things. It was very much a conversation with what had gone before. Um, and I found it a really interesting way of sort of trying out new ideas or techniques that I might not have tried otherwise. Um, and just seeing how different people respond to exactly the same sort of basic stimulus to start with. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll run a similar project again in future because I think a lot of people got a lot out of it. It's really good fun. Mm, that's that's really encouraging to hear of the, uh, the, what the outcome of that project. I wonder what it's what it's given you that other projects haven't. Um, like ABC. I think it kind of shakes you out of your comfort zone, out of your usual way of doing things. So that the the second book there with all the kind of black and pink shapes, um, that just came to me as the, so the book had just been folded mostly. I don't think there was much else done to it. Um, and I was a little bit stumped to start with. I just thought, oh, I wouldn't know. This is not, it's not a piece of, I wouldn't work like that normally. So it was really interesting. I had to sort of sit with it on my desk for a week or so before I could kind of think how I could respond to that and what I could add to that conversation. Um, so it just, yeah, it just kind of shakes you up a little bit and kind of makes you think in different ways um, and react, react to other people's work, which I think I'm it, working on my own so much that I, you can be guilty of working in a vacuum. So I just found that very stimulating working with other people in that way. Yeah, I can see how that would really kind of give, as you said, you had to live with something for a while, give you time to sort of digest, think how you're going to respond. It's a really good challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it is, definitely. Yeah. So staying creative and active during this period, I think, has been challenging for lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wondered what's inspired you to keep on creating? Uh, it's definitely kind of responding to briefs that other people have put out or calls. Um, so this this was again part of the artist book club at UWE. It was meant to be a, a sort of physical face-to-face -face workshop, but it was changed into a Zoom workshop. Um, it's with Beth Calverley, um, who is a poet. And so she led a, a workshop with members of ABC um, I can't remember how many of us there were. It wasn't, it was more than the 12 shown there, but not many more, about 15 of us, I think. Um, and she, she gave us various exercises and prompts for us to talk about um, the process of making books, why we like making books. And as a result, she sort of magically came up with this um, poem that she just typed in five minutes at the end of the workshop, which is quite astonishing. Um, and then from that, this is an ongoing thing, We've uh, each of us that took part has been given two or three lines and we're going to illustrate those individually and then they will be put together um, in a book later in the year. Um, so again, that's not a way, I wouldn't normally work with poetry, I wouldn't um, I normally work with words in this way, but it's just a really nice opportunity to yeah, get outside of my comfort zone and do something new and be part of something that yeah something collaborative like that that mm -hmm. we don't actually I've got no idea what the end result is going to look like but that's quite nice mm -hmm. definitely um, and then this this has been a really great shot in the arm actually um, at the beginning of lockdown um, sort of April time I purchased an alpha set from um, a guy called Will Mower who's based in in Brighton uh, and he's made this, um, this amazing modular typography set, printing set, um, with a little book that goes with it. So those, um, those shapes you see there, you can make all the letters of the alphabet and all the numbers just out of those basic shapes. Uh, and they print with a laser cut and um, all hand finished. Um, it's really, really useful set to have. Um, and he set a he set a, a number of briefs for people that had bought the set to as almost as a prompt to try and get people to to engage with it and and that's been really great because people have been posting that on Instagram so you can see what other people who've bought the set have done um, so I'll just show some of the work for that so the the first brief was a poster to do a poster with a message on it 
Um, and we had some socially distanced VE Day celebrations in our streets at the beginning of May. So um, I was kind of keen for it not to be too Brexity. So I went down a slightly different retro route um, and, and did this uh, Vera Lynn um, typography piece that went in our window as part of a bigger window display. Um, and it was really, it was really great to be able to print type that large, but without needing any sort of digital means. So it took a little bit of sort of mathematical working out to get things lined up. But I could see the potential of it really quickly. So it was great to have a brief that was set that, that I might not have otherwise have used that for that purpose. And then the second brief was to come up with some elaborate letter forms based on using the set. Um, and Will made a really, a really great um, animation of the different letters on Instagram. So it's worth having a look at that because some people came up with some really, really crazy ideas. And again, it's just really inspiring to see what other people do with exactly the same source material. Um, the third brief was very much more in my comfort zone, which was pattern. Um, so that was using that. So instead of using it for type, actually just using the shapes as for repeat patterns. Um, which I really enjoyed. And then the final brief was you were paired with somebody else um, who had bought an alpha set and it was a, a mail art exchange. So mine started life as a print and then very predictably ended up as a little Constantina book. Um, and I, the holes that you see kind of um, when you shine a light behind it, it kind of gives it an added dimension as the light shines through the holes. But that my original idea was to include stitch on there, but once I stitched through those holes, I realized I didn't really like the end effect. So I took the, took the thread out and preferred the, the holes as they were. Um, and that's called track and trace, because that's just, I realized an awful lot of the work that I've been doing in lockdown has been yellow and black, which is a color combination or gray. That's a color combination I don't use very much normally, but I think I've uh, been subconsciously influenced by all these awful daily briefings on the television news. Um, there's been an awful lot of yellow used in sort of emergency measures type graphics. And so I think it's kind of seeped into my subconscious. <laughs> it's coming out through my books. <laughs> That's really interesting, though, that Will, through his um, through his efforts of kind of, of having brief for people to uh, who've bought the sats to get creative with them it's not only prompting people to actually make work but he's really created a, a whole community hasn't he yeah definitely and he's i think he said that he's going to then put these um prompts in with the next batch of alpha sets that he makes and so they will actually become part of the kit to, um, to encourage people to sort of have a play with it but yeah i'd like to think that they will continue kind of um yeah, being in touch some of the people that have done stuff with the set because it's been a, it's been a really positive experience. It's been great, and again, it's it's creating something that wouldn't otherwise have existed because I wouldn't have. I was pleased to get the set, but I, I can imagine having been quite busy that I would have just put it to one side for a while, and I might have come back to it in a few months. But um, it was great to have the the reason to kind of go, no, no, I'm going to get this out and and create something. So that was great. Yeah, you've really integrated it into your everyday as well, which is that's something that I really like. If if an event was coming up, like you said, like VE Day, you use that as an opportunity to get to grips with the set. Yeah, no, it was really fun. It was good. Um, and this one is a woman called Yvonne Foster, who, again, I heard about on Instagram. I think somebody else that I follow had been sent a little set of collage material from her um, and there was a link to, to her feed so I looked it up and she's just got this ongoing project called My Miniature Art Gallery where she sends out these tiny packs of, of little scraps of paper and encourages people to make tiny works of art from them um, and I, I received the paper and I thought oh, that's great I, could I think I can make two or three out of that um, and actually it became more of a challenge as it went on I kind of thought oh, I think I might be able to squeeze another one out of this and so <laughs> I got up to nine and I think I had to have a defeat then and I couldn't get any more out there, there really were just scraps left um, but again it's just creating creating work that wouldn't otherwise have existed it kind of stretches you to do something a bit different um, and someone else on Instagram saw this and then got in touch with me and told me about another open call for collage that's coming tiny collages that's coming up in august 
Well, so again, it just sort of snow, it can some of these things can snowball. It just makes connections that weren't yeah. there before. Yeah, and I think uh, the original um, impetus behind Yvonne's project, uh, like you were saying, a, a lot of things that you've done over the period of lockdown, you know, have really helped your well-being through creating. And uh, I know that, that that was something that she she was really kind of keen to develop uh, with this project. And as you said, it's ongoing, so the sets are still available. Um, yeah, if anyone... no, I really recommend it. It's, it was really interesting working with material supplied by somebody else. And other than things being small, I, th I think you can set your own restrictions, really. But my, mine were just that I decided they'd be four centimetres square and that each, each collage had to involve two words, which were cut from, from stuff that she had sent. Um, and some make more sense than others and some were just a bit random. But... Um, but again, it's just about setting those self-imposed uh, limits or restrictions and briefs. And what was interesting was the, the collages that I'm happiest with are the ones that I made f towards the end of doing the project. Um, so as, as the material became more and more limited, actually, I, I think it, it focuses your mind a lot more on oh. the choices that you make. Um, so that was quite a useful lesson as well. Yeah. Um, I just talk briefly about this at the start of the lockdown one of the things I realized is that I need to still build in time each day to be drawing because it's something that's really important to me but it's it was easy to see how with everything else going on that that could fall by the wayside um, and I saw something from I think Sarah Bobman sent around something about this um, 28 day challenge from the Brooklyn Art Library which you could sign up to and they would send you a prompt each day um for work to do and i must admit i i abandoned it after a week because it moved away from drawing and i, I my original plan was that i i was doing this in, in order to make me draw a bit more um but i did this for just over a week um and and it was good it got me it got me back into the idea of doing a daily drawing which i think has a kind of meditative benefit and um just sort of calms your brain a little bit because i'm um, certainly in the first week or so of lockdown my brain was pinging around a bit thinking oh i need to do this i need to think about this i need to worry about this and actually if you just spend sort of you know 15 20 minutes just sitting drawing it's very calming um and again it, it's about doing things that i wouldn't otherwise have done so they were asking you to draw a character from your favorite book um, and I just read an Annie Prue book called Accordion Tales. So it's not a ca character as such, but um, there's an accordion that features through lots of, um, sort of short stories in that book. Um, and the one on the right is something that you have found by chance. And this was an old thermometer that I found in my garden in Oxford years ago that I dug up when I was digging a veg patch. And uh, it's pretty battered, but I just really like it. And it was just really nice to take the time to look at something like that that's just sort of been propped up on a shelf in my studio for years um, and to look at it really carefully and to um, yeah to in order to draw it you have to really examine it so I really enjoyed that process. Mm, I think that that sort of echoes what a lot of people have been discovering in lockdown is is that ability to look more closely whether it's doing that through looking at an object or drawing it or being out in nature um, and and seeing spring turn into summer etc we we've, we've kind of really honed in on things that are important to us haven't we yeah definitely it's it's slowed things down i've done a lot i've done a lot more gardening a lot more growing things from seed and um, I've started um, experimenting with natural dyes, so things that I can, you know, use from my garden or from my surrounding area that I can use as dyes for fabric and things like that that are just more a slower process. Um, and you've just got a little bit more time to, to think about things and feel a bit more connected to your environment. I think that's really important. We'll have to get you back to talk about... Um, what you've been doing with dyes and textiles that sounds fascinating well it's very early days and there's an awful lot of brown brown fabric knocking about <laughs> i'll book you in for next year then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um i'd really like to talk i know that you've made a piece of work related um to the coronavirus pandemic um specifics around the situation as i chose it as one of my books for the current ue library exhibition so i wondered whether you could talk us 
through your lockdown manifesto project yeah certainly and thanks very much for choosing it for the exhibition my pleasure um, so this was this was done as part of a an abc call uh, as a mail art exchange so um i made the original one from rubber stamps uh for jen harrison up in scotland um and because it took quite a while to carve things from rubber um i decided to make a little digital edition and then as i was thinking about it um I kind of thought I'd, I'd make it as a fundraiser. So the general idea of the book is coming back to this idea of me thinking it was really important to make time each day to draw something. Um, I, I thought very early on in the in the lockdown, I kind of I really thought what are the what are the coping strategies that I need to get through this time, which in the end actually wasn't as challenging as it has been for a lot of people. I've been very fortunate, but um, there was a lot of uncertainty at the beginning of lockdown. And so I was thinking, what are the kind of fundamentals that are really important to me? Um, and cooking good food, growing things, drawing, making, reading. I have actually I've been reading an awful lot more during lockdown. Um, talking, which is more about staying in touch and staying connected with friends and family and helping, which is more to do with, we could read that however you want, but um, from my point of view, it's about connecting with people in your local area, uh, neighbours who needed help um, in some way, whether it's with shopping or helping with sorting out technology issues. Um, I just think it's, I've got a lot more involved with the local community group over the past few months as well. Uh, and without getting too political about it, things nationally are in such a, a mess that it could, I could weep, but I have no control over that. So I kind of have felt that where you can have influence is on a much more local level. So I made this book and have sold it as a fundraiser for um, Bristol Northwest Food Bank. Um, and I've raised almost £150 so far, which is brilliant. And I'm, I'm just really grateful to everyone that's bought a copy. Um, and it's just been nice to, again, to see, to give a, an, initial, an idea that was conceived for one project, but then to give it a kind of an extra lease of life, really. Um, so it's been really good to, to kind of uh, be able to raise some money through this. And um, so, yeah, it's still available if anybody would like to buy one from my online shop. So uh, there we go. Well, that leads me to my last question, which <laughs> uh, good segue. Just thinking about social media and dissemination platforms, um, thinking about which ones you use the most and, and which ones are, are beneficial to you, especially kind of over this period of time. Yeah, I've really I'm quite selective in my use of social media. Um, I, I have a website for my graphic design and uh, illustration work, uh, which I, which is under the hat of good thinking. Um, but then I have a website for my illustration work and uh, it's more really my, my book work um, that I do. So it's sort of extracurricular stuff. So that's where I have a blog and an online shop, um, which is corinnewelch.co.uk. Um, and then my Instagram feed is where I, just post up a lot of work in progress so often that that does feed into the blog um so instagram is kind of a bit more immediate and i know not everyone has positive experiences of instagram but i've found by using it in a limited way just posting up work in progress and ideas i've i've found it a really supportive community of people um and i've kind of met new people that i wouldn't have otherwise come into contact with i find it really inspiring to see what other people are up to um, and I don't find it, yeah, I don't, I don't find it, um, I think it's a positive, a positive thing to use. I, I guess different people have different experiences with it. But for me, Instagram is, I can't get on with Facebook and I, I don't really do Twitter. But, um, but Instagram is definitely something that I, I get a lot out of using. So that's good. I think in also the projects that you've engaged with have come from, um, a, a platform of sharing and and building a community anyway of uh, and also kind of a, a positivity about comparison etc yeah yeah definitely yeah no it doesn't always need to be about feeling jealous about what someone's doing I think it can be it's about taking 
yeah, take, taking inspiration from what other people are doing, which um, I think is possible with Instagram, definitely. Well, I think, Corinne, you've given us so much information. You've, you've been really selfless in sharing your work. So I'm sure you've been an inspiration to lots of people who will be listening as part of the Print and Book Festival today. So you'll have to imagine me um, but lots of other people clapping with me as I <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your practice and um, your creativity with us uh, today. Thank you, Corinne. Thanks very much, Angie, for inviting me. It's been really great talking to you. My pleasure. <laughs>